should contemplate this question. Are you ready? Are you ready? You can tell me that you're ready, but are you truly ready? I was talking to uh, Brother Ezra yesterday when I was leaving here, and he and I was just exchanging scripture that your life is but a vapor. Are you ready? We can take that to another level and say, are you ready to meet God? Are you truly born again? That is a serious question, way far more than what you're going to decide next Tuesday. If you're here, are you ready? Spurgeon said this, and I've said this a few weeks ago, the sermon is knowing the difference between right and almost right. Because you can be almost right, yet wrong, dead wrong. So that's discernment. And remember a few weeks ago, we gave you, if you weren't here, we gave you uh, a checklist, Satan's checklist. This is something that he does on a regular basis. He's going to keep you from God's word if you're a child of God. Now, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, this, this is his attack to you. If you're not, then the Bible says you are one of his. You, you, listen, we can argue biologically all we want. We can get some professor or some politician that tells us, well, we can't tell you if there's a male or female. Y yes, we can. But far greater than that, they're either, you're either saved or unsaved. Jew, Gentile. Okay, so let's not get it all twisted. He distracted us from praying. How many of y'all know how that is? Amen. Y'all can, everybody can raise your hand on that. The minute you go to pray, here comes the phone, text message, something happens. Your knee pops out of place. Amen. You, you go to kneel before the Lord and all of a sudden a pain comes to you, Charles, that, man, where that pain come from? You young folks, y'all will be there. Just keep on living. You say, well, they always up there talking about their pain and how they feel. And I said, just keep on living. As the old folks would say, by and by. You're going to wake up one day and like, oh, where, where is that from? What is that all about? He blinds us to sin. It's not that bad. You can have that bad thought about her. You can have that bad thought about him. Uh, I'm going to get mad. I'm going to get back at that driver. Amen, Kevin. You pull out in front of me, I'm going to show you something. He blinds us to sin. He removes us from church or of koinonia or fellowship. I understand there's various things that we have to do from time to time. I understand that. I'm not opposed to that. But that's not really what I'm getting at here. When you just habitually say, you know what, I'm not doing this today. And then the final one, that he justifies all of the above. So are you ready? I don't have a screen for that, but are you ready? Jude. I can't say chapter one because there's only one chapter. Jude is a book that's small 
but yet powerful. When I was reading it, I always thought of the Mike Tyson in his prime. That you didn't get out of the first round with him. That's Jude. And we're going to pick up, because you should have your notes, I took the time to make an outline or notes for you that you can write on. Also, I gave you some reflection questions in the back. That you can go home and you can look at what you've heard and what you wrote down and what you are reading and say, wait, wait a minute, let me look at this a little bit closer. That is the idea. That's why I say bring a pen, a pad to church. Because I don't remember what I had for dinner a few days ago. And some of y'all know what I mean. We forget. Well, what did he say? That's why we should clear our minds. When we come into the household of faith, when we come in to hear from the Lord, when we come to have fellowship with each other, everything on the outside should just be blocked out. Having the Sabbath day that we're here, that we're here worshiping the true and only God. He said, just give me that. Can I have that? Let's look at verse 5. Now, understand what is happening here. Jude is talking to Jewish Christians. They did not have the Old Testament, I mean the New Testament, but they understood the Old Testament. So they understood what he was saying here. But I want to remind you, because the last time we were in front of you, we said history matters. Understanding history matters. Because they say, oh, the old saying is, if you don't understand history, you're doomed to repeat it. If you, if you don't understand where you come from, if you don't understand what happened in the past, you're doomed to repeat it. Though you once knew that the Lord has saved the people out of the land of Egypt. We went through that. Here they are in slavery. He brought them out, took them to the Red Sea. Moses is up there crying. He said, why are you crying? Stretch out your rod. See, we have the power already. Why are we sitting here crying about it? We already have everything that we need in godliness already if you're a child of God. You have the indwelling Holy Spirit. Why are we standing there crying? He is already on the inside, and yes, he is already on the inside. The problem that we have is that we walk away from him. We walk away from God. We walk away from his word. We walk away from his commandments. We walk away from his spirit. Then when we get out there in the middle of nowhere, we say, well, what's going on with this? Well, where's the Lord? The Lord is right where he was when he met you in the first place. He hasn't moved. He hasn't changed. Here they are at the Red Sea, and they walk across on dry ground. They've seen all the miracles. They've seen everything. They get to the other side, and guess what? Start complaining. Now, we're not far moved from that, y'all. God has brought you out of a mighty long way. Ted, I'm sorry, I keep bringing this up. When your car went back in the canal, he's brought you from that situation to this day. And everybody in here has a testimony about where he's brought you from. So why are we sitting here complaining? Well, I don't have the new S580 that I wanted, but you have a car. My house is not the right color that I wanted. Well, they still have paint at Home Depot. Just get with Sherb. If he's still doing it, he'll, he'll hook you up. But why are we complaining so much? That's what they were doing. Then these angels that he talks about in verse 6, they did not keep their proper dominion. 
They, they, they got out of line. And the ones that he's referring to here, these boys cannot even be controlled by Satan himself. They're underneath hell. They're underneath Hades. I said this before. We were talking to Spivey and I were talking back and forth. And that they, if they were let loose, we could not deal with them. Just, just think about that for a minute. Satan right now is kind of bound. He's kind of on a leash. Imagine when he is set free. Just something to think about. They're underneath hell until that judgment day. Because if they were let loose, they would just wreak havoc. Something to think about. Then he goes and talks about Sodom and Gomorrah. That they were just filled with just immorality. Lot, we don't want your virgin daughters. We want them angels. We don't, and then Lot didn't win the father of the year. Offered his daughters. I, I just don't know any man would do that. He, he was saved. He, was, he, he made it in, but... I just won't give him Father of the Year award. They were full of sexual immorality. You say, well, what's going on? Well, just look around today. They're parading children, little babies, in front of men who are dressed like women and telling them this is what it's all about. Michigan right now on their, on their voting ballot, Prop 3 or 4 it's called, that they want to inject something in the children to kind of take down who they are and mutilate them without parents' permission. It's on the ballot. I never thought I would see a day like this. I, I, didn't, I didn't think that. I told some guys at the barbershop the other day, I said, Satan really is not worried about us. But he wants them little ones. The, the, the babies. The teenagers. Well, they're, they're, they're influenced. And I'm going to put you all out there. They're putting their ear pods in the ear. You don't know what they're listening to. All day long. I will challenge you to just look at the phones. You paying for it. I know I'm not going to get a Christmas present from the young people to, you know. Why do I have to sit here and negotiate what you, I see on your phone? The last time I checked, when I went to AT&T, I paid the bill. Let's start in verse 8. Likewise, these dreamers, these dreamers. Now, understanding what he's telling us here, he wants and he's telling us that the fight is on for false teaching. Jesus warned them. Peter warned them. Paul warned them. Now, here is Jude warning them of the false teachers that are inside, not coming inside the church. Because if you read up in the first couple of verses, he says, they crept in unannounced. That means they were there. He said, well, they ain't coming. They're, they're there. Can, can, can I open up a little bit for you? What, what, one of the things that hurts me, not only as just a pastor, but just as a believer, is when I hear that someone else has fallen out of the faith. They, they got hook wing. And they went to some other religion. That, that, that's hurting for me. And then they know the truth. They've been taught the truth. But yet they just refuse to accept the truth. Maybe it's their pride. I wrote down, maybe it's their pride. Their attitude of unwillingness to admit that, hey, I've been seduced. I've been tricked. Maybe it's ignorance. I don't know. What is it? I don't know. God has provided us his word. 
And that's why he tells us over and over and over again, grow up, be mature, get into the word, stop being babes in Christ. Because the days and times now are evil. New Life, we cannot just minimize this issue. Write this in the margin of your notes, just on the very top, wherever you want. Read 2 Peter 2, 1 through 22 this week. And look and see what Peter has to say about this. Peter sounds almost identical to Jude of the false prophets coming in, a wicked generation, despising authority. And that's what we see today. I like what it says in verse 19. They promise freedom, but they themselves are slaves of sin and corruption. Uh, they're standing up. These false teachers are telling you, hey, I, I, I can tell you what truth is, but yet they're enslaved. Now Jude goes from history to verse 8. Now he goes to actions of these false teachers, dreamers. These are the ones that come and tell you I have a special, in your notes, I have a special revelation from God. Uh, God has appeared to me. They suppress the truth. They, they come to you with what I call phony visionaries. Their viewpoint is always this special revelation of God. Warren Wisby put it this way, these people live in a dream world. They're unrealistic. They are delusional. Many false teachers and false religions started this way. What about the Mormons? It was a dream. And now look at it. It's really a whole state, the state of Utah. They have a whole university, BYU. What about Islam? Started off with a dream. They dress up. Satan trick has not changed. He dresses up a lie into this, this new revelation of God. That's his trick. Just write this down. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. 14. Satan disguised himself as an angel of light. How many of y'all heard this? Close your eyes and see green. You cannot lose with the stuff I use. Rem mic. Yes, I can. I can lose my money. So, yeah, I can lose with the stuff I use. But guess what has happened? Now this new packaging, this new look, is just it's the same old, same old now. He was saying that back in the 60s and 70s. They just package it up different now. So, you can't lose with the stuff I use. Kevin, we'll lose our money, brother. That's what we'll lose. But saints of God, we can know, not guess, we can know what God is saying in his word. We don't have to guess. And Jude said, listen, in verse 3, uh, that your faith was once delivered to you from them of old. This is nothing new. You, you've heard about this. You've heard about this for years. There's nothing new. These dreamers, they live in an un unreal world. They're, they're not living in reality. They claim to have special revelations from God. Now, I want to go over something with you. These dreamers reject objective truth of Scripture, but go with subjective experience. Put it up. Let's go. They reject objective truth of God's Word, but go with what? Subjective experience. Now, go to the next one. There's a tree, right? No, not really a tree. One guy thinks it's an apple. Not an apple tree, that a tree is an apple. And the girl thinks, well, there's money there. So now she has object the objective reality is the tree. But their subjective interpretation and what they're looking at, it's all messed up. God has already laid it out in his word. So what experience are you looking for? The objective reality is right in front of you. Go to the next one. So you have subjective truth and objective truths. Look, either true or false, can be wrong, 
about things. Subjective, neither true or false. That's where we are today. Well, it's not really true. Your true is what you make it. Well, you're not really sitting on a chair. It could be a stool, but no, it may not be a stool. It could be just a soft cushion that you rest. It's a chair. Amen? It's a tree. So it's neither true or false. Can't be wrong. Well, that's your view. That's how you view it, Kevin. Mike, what does the Scripture say? What, what, what does the Scripture say? Well, you know, Pastor Tommy, I mean, there's no really male nor female. What? What does the Scripture say? He said, I created man and woman. I created a woman for the man and vice versa. What? 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 Why are we over here with subjective truths? Or I should say subjective false truth. Jeremiah, write this down, 23, 25. They say, I have a dream, I have a dream. Just because you have a dream does not make it true. I'm sorry. I don't care what Sister Cleo said to you. You, Just because you have a dream does not make it true. The best and only reliable source is what? The Word of God. It, th- 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 here it is. You say, well, what about the lost books of the Bible? Deal with the 66, then we'll have another meeting about those lost books. Dreamers. We have the full canon of Scripture inspired by God. Well, what about the book of uh, Enoch? Well, what about this? What about the 66? Do, are, are you diving into that? Are you getting a historical context of this? Do you know exactly who Hebrews was writing to? It was Jewish Christians. What about, oh, I, we're going to worry about the lost books of the Bible. Why? Let's deal with this. Genesis, the Revelation. They're dreamers. Number two, these ungodly people pollute their own bodies. If you're in the NIV or the New KJV, it says defile the flesh. He is not talking about skin. They defile what's on the inside. They're ungodly, first of all. In other words, they do not have Jesus Christ. They can stand up. They look good. They sound good. They have a big television program, but they're not of God. They're ungodly people. They pollute their own bodies. That's why Mark 7 tells us it's not what's in, it's it's not what a man does, it's what's in here. Because what's in here is going to come out. The heart is wicked. And the Bible says, who can know it? You should have been in Sunday school this morning. Deacon McGinnis talked about this. And I'm sitting up there like, well, look at this. I didn't even look at the lesson for today in Sunday school. But here's Deacon McGinnis standing up talking about this very thing. That you don't understand how wicked that you're, I believe in total depravity of man. That means there's no good in you until Jesus Christ come and take residence in your life. You say, well, I give to the poor. I don't care how much you give. You are wretch undone. Pastor, you, you're not compassionate. You, you're supposed to love people. I do. I love you the truth. To give you the truth of God's Word because the Bible says right now, if you're not a part of Christ, you're already condemned. I love you enough to tell you. He goes on and says, the evil comes from within that defiles a person. You can look at me all day in the face, but in your heart, you hate my guts. What Jude is saying is, he says, it's the core of the person. The actual who you really are. You know that person that you won't tell anybody about? That person. The one God knows, that person. These, these false prophets, they came in and they polluted the church. And they had basically in their heart sexual immorality. Standing up, preaching the word of God, but deep down in their heart, they had sexual desires for people. J- 
just like those days of Noah back in Sodom and Gomorrah. They live with, they live with the idea of subjective experience. If it feels good, guess what? Do it. If it makes you feel good, go ahead. Ain't no problem. God ain't going to do nothing. He ain't done nothing yet. Okay. These false teachers, these apostates, they're corrupt. They pollute not only themselves, but other people around them. That's why Paul warns Timothy of the same thing. Over in 2 Timothy chapter 2, 3, and 5, you can read it all. Just read all. We should be reading the saints. If you read the word, you'll see it right there. They've been deceiving for years and years and years, and they are here now. They're imposters, and they continue to increase. And Timothy says, and Paul, they're deceiving and being deceived. Wait a minute. They're, they're deceiving you, but they themselves are deceived. They deceive them. They believe in their own lie. They believe it. Again, they look good in their speech. They do these miracles. They do these lying wonders, but God has nothing to do with it. The only person that they're controlled by is Satan. They're dreamers. They're ungodly people that in the core of who they are, they're ungodly and they, uh, just, they're, they're mutilating the flesh. Here's the third one. They reject authority and speak evil of dignitaries. You can see it right there in the text. Their system denies the authority, number one, in your notes, God's word. They reject the authority of God's word. He has laid it out for us. One man, one woman for one lifetime. And what do we do? No, and that's not really what it means. We can just live together. They go against the orthodoxy of teaching that's been going on for hundreds and thousands of years. They're just going to disregard that. Well, that's not what he means. That's not what he says. They reject the authority of God's word. Well, God, that's what Satan did went into a perfect environment and ran it what? Raggedy. In fact, it even started before then. He was in heaven. And I wanted to be like the most high. I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. And took a third or so of the angelic host with him. We're going to talk about him in a minute. They reject the authority of the God, God's word altogether. They reject the authority of church leadership. So they deny the word of God. They ignore the word of God. They explain away the word of God. They twist the word of God. Then it goes off into church leadership. If anyone, Paul tells them, if anyone teaches something different, ignore they're, they're ignorant. They lack understanding. Don't follow them. Someone came knocking at my door yesterday, two of them. Y'all know they're out, they out, they out now all times of day now. Used to be in the morning. Now they come in the afternoon when they know you home from work. And press my doorbell. I looked out the window. I don't have, I'm very polite. I just simply said, I'm good. Can we talk to you? No. I've already said too much now. I'm good. So they just turned around and walked down the steps. They, they went on about their way. They come inside the church, and they, wanna, they don't want to go under church leadership. They always want to stand up and tell you how much they know. Well, I know seven verses of Scripture. Well, I know two and a half. What's that all about? We're supposed to be doing this together. We're supposed to be like, like, hey, helping each other grow, not sitting here finding out how much we know. Some of the most, the humblest people I've met were some of my professors back in school. These men wrote books after books after books 
spoke all the languages, was pre were preached from the Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic Bible, and then they was the most humblest men in the world. They'll come and tell you, they said, hey, I don't know everything. And we, our mouths would just drop. What? You don't know everything? You have three doctorates. He'll tell you, I don't know everything. But these men come in the church, and they want to show you how much they know. But their minds are corrupt. All you have to do is look at TV. I would encourage you not to. You'll see exactly what, you'll see what Paul and Jude is talking about. They give out half-truths, which is really not true. They look good. You can give online if you want to. They're dreamers. They're ungodly people. They reject the authority of God's word. Look at what they do. Number three, they reject even the angelic host. These men say they can slander God, his word, his son, the spirit, and yes, even Satan himself. Look at verse 9. Yet Michael, an archangel, in contending with the devil, when he was disputing about the body of Moses. I was like, wait a minute now. This, I said, Lord, come on now. Why is this in here? What's going on here about this? Moses had a funeral that Jay and Paradise wasn't involved in. There was no rearrangement because God took control of his funeral. He didn't have to call Jay. The family had nothing to say about this. And the service was only five words according to Joshua chapter 1. Moses, my servant, is dead. Amen. Let's go. That was it. They don't know where his body is to this day. He saw the promised land, but he couldn't go in. Why? Because he had an anger problem. He was disobedient to God. There were no reflections. There were no flowers. There was no viewing. There was no repass. A five word, that was it. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, I need to put a little caveat here. There's a writing called the Assumption of Moses, that some scholars are saying, this is where Jude is pulling this from. That is not inspired by God. It has some validity to Jewish literature. If you're a Jewish person and you read the Assumption of Moses, you will understand what they're saying, because that's how we have to look at this in context, y'all. He was talking to Jewish Christians now. So they had a history, and they understood the first five books of the Bible. And so now you have somebody saying the assumption of Moses, you know, but listen, and listen, I, I see what God has put here. I'm just going to go with that. Amen. Amen. We're we just going to deal with that. that. That's academia. We can talk about it over breakfast at a, at a restaurant one day. But I always ask the question, why? What's going on here? Why is he fighting over the body of Moses? Here's my assumption. Maybe Satan wanted the body of Moses. Maybe you want to re-resurrect uh, re, re Moses and use Moses. Why? Acts 7.22 saying, man, Moses was very learned and wise in Egypt. And he was a man of mighty words and deeds. So if Moses can be resurrected, man, we can do something with him. It's just a thought. Is that in Scripture? No, it's a thought. Based on Acts 7.22. Jude is speaking to Jewish Christians here. Again, they knew history. And look at what it says in verse 9b. Dare not bring against him a reviling accusation. We're going to talk about this. The Lord rebukes you. Please hear me now. Moses or Michael is an archangel. I, I, we need to have a little study now, right? Michael is an archangel. One of only two mentioned in the Bible. The other one is who? Gabriel. That's only mentioned in the Bible. No one else. That's it. His name means who is like God. He's over the nation of Israel. According to Revelation chapter 12, 7 through 9, Satan, he has the power to cast Satan out of heaven along with the other angels. 
not just himself. Now understand this. Michael is an archangel. Satan is a what? Cherubim. Cherubims are higher ranking than Michael. Y- y'all follow me now? This, this gonna get now. They're seraphims. Isaiah chapter six. What they are in the praise team? You have cherubims, which is Satan. He is over and more ranking than Michael, and Michael is a bad boy. You, you, you follow this? And you see what the scripture is saying? Michael is the chief angel. Satan was number two in charge. You say, what? Yes, he was number two. Why? Father, Son, Holy Spirit, they're one. Amen. Y'all get it. So now Satan was number two in charge. He got kicked out of heaven like lightning. Y'all know where I'm going with this? Kevin, you know where I'm going? You think I know where I'm going with this? Then you have seraphims, cherubims, dominions. Those are mental angels. You have principalities, archangels, and the other angels are in the lower half. So Michael is in the lower half. So Michael is standing there. We must, <laughs> we must show a level of respect to Satan. He's like, oh, I never heard that. It's right there in the text. You have Michael, the archangel. He showed Satan a level of respect. It says it right there. We have to understand this. When you read Ephesians 6, 12, for we struggle not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against powers in the dark world, against spiritual forces in the heavenly realm. This thing is real. You remember Acts chapter 19? The son of what? Excuse me. They jumped on that man. They come and say, hey, come out of here. They say, wait a minute, who are you? We we know, we know Jesus. We understand. Who are you? I'm gonna, gonna mess y'all up right now. Maybe not. The word of God never gives a follower of Christ authority to rebuke the devil. I'll say it one more again. The Word of God never gives a follower of Jesus Christ authority to rebuke the devil. You've heard too much on TV. Zechariah 3, 2, write it down in your notes. The Lord said to Satan, the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebukes you. Michael is an archangel, and he said, the Lord rebukes you. We don't have the authority to rebuke Satan. Turn to James chapter 4. I'll show you. See, we just talked about this in Sunday school today. If you were here, you would have heard it. I'm just going to encourage you, come out. It's some heavy teaching going on. We thank our deacons for that. James chapter 4, verse 7, is going to give you a clear-cut sign of how we do this. We are to do the following. It's in your notes. It says, submit yourselves unto God. That is the first step. If you're not submitting, ain't no rebuking. He ain't fleeing. If you, if you think Satan is going to flee from you with just you? No, I'm a little heavier than that, but hey, thank you, Fred. Look at it, James chapter 4, 7. It says, submit yourselves then to God. That means to arrange yourself under the commandments and the viewpoint of not your own, but on God's word. Not your human viewpoints. You submit yourself to the authority of Scripture. Whenever I wake up in the morning, I'm going to submit to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When I'm going through the middle of my day, despite what is going on, I'm going to submit to the Word of God. He never gives us the authority to rebuke Satan. Let me tell you something. 
You can't. Surround yourself in the word of God. Submit to the Lord daily. Submit to his authority in your life. Because we submit anyway. Right? Y'all go to work tomorrow. Y'all going to submit. Why? They tell you to be to work. You're going to be right there. I, and Liz, I need you there on time. I need you here at this time. Guess what? Liz, there running red lights and everything. They tell us to pay our taxes, our property taxes. Guess what? You submit to that. You pay it. So now God is saying, I want you to submit to government how crazy they are right now, but I still submit to them and I pray for them. On our jobs, even Hebrews 13, 17, the leadership of the church, follow me as I follow Christ. When you see me going off sideways, pull me aside. I won't bring that up, Daryl. I'll let that go this morning. <laughs> we ought to submit in our marriage. Wives, submit to your husbands. Ephesians 5, 22, 23. And that word submission is not like y'all think. If you haven't been here, we go, we'll talk about that one day in marriage. You, we, we get it all mixed up when he says submit to your own husband. And then we get bent. I ain't submitting to no man. Come on now. Come on now. If you're a child of God, you have no, that's what he tells us. There again, you're getting under the authority of scripture. The highest authority is God. Submit yourselves unto the Lord. And then look at what it says. Resist in your notes, the devil, and he will flee. But you first have to what? Submit. If you're not submitting to the authority of God in your life, if you're not submitting to his word, if you're not confessing sin in your life, you are not going to resist the devil. Amen. So how do you know that? The scripture tells me that. Well, I'm just going to resist them. The devil is a liar. He already know that. So why are you saying that? He's the father of lies. He went into a perfect situation and, made, and messed it up. Then he had the audacity to go see Jesus. And tell Jesus, I'll do this for you. What? And I told Deacon Miller, I said, you know what? What's funny about that? I said, he knew who God, he knew who Jesus was. There must be a level of respect when you're dealing with Satan. He is nothing to be played with. Michael. The angel over Israel, during the coming of the Lord, he's going to come with the angels and deal with Satan. He says, you know what? Lord rebukes you, man. How do you, how, how do you resist the devil? You submit to this. Because the temptations are going to come. Temptations to do whatever. We always think temptation means sexual. It could be temptation to anything. It could be a temptation of gluttony, a temptation of everything. That's why he said in Ephesians 6.10, 6, he says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. You do not, all of us combined, plus every church in Dade County, does not have what it takes to deal with Lucifer. He runs up to the throne accusing you, the scripture says. What about my servant Job? The only reason he's serving you, Lord, because you have a hedge around him. You should read that story one day. And there's a story there in chapter 2 where when, when Job lost it all, his friends got together, and for seven days and seven nights, they saw the grief on his face, and they said nothing. What's my point? Sometimes you just need to be quiet. You don't have to always run your mouth. When somebody's going through something, someone's lost a loved one, you don't know what unless you've experienced that. If you have not experienced what Brother Ketch is going through right now, be quiet. Just pray. 
if you've experienced that, then you know what he's going through. Pray for him. I thought about my own family. I have an older son. I have a younger daughter. And to get that news of my firstborn and my only son. Sometimes we just need to be quiet and just pray. So here's the how do we do this. In your outline, here it is. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. You say, well, Pastor Tommy, how do, how, how do I do this? How do I submit myself unto the Lord? How, how, how do I resist the devil? Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, you can write down in your notes, Ephesians 4.30. But do not grieve, grieve the Holy Spirit by where you're sealed to the day of redemption. We're able to deal with the temptations of, of Satan, but we have to not grieve the Holy Spirit. It's, ah, I told you not to do that, and you did it anyway. Quenching is what? Hey, I want you to go witness to your neighbor, and you, do, you don't do it. I, I want you to share the gospel with this person, and you don't do it. Now you're what? You're quenching. Grieving is now basically you're sinning. You're sinning. You're doing something that he told you not to do. You, you know you shouldn't be doing it. You fell into that temptation, but he gave a way out for you, but you didn't take it. You're grieving the Holy Spirit. Guess what? If you're a child of God, guess what you do? Get down on your knees. Go to 1 John 1, 9. Lord, I repent of that sin. I repent of that thought. I repent of that action. That means what I was once doing, now I'm going this way. I'm not going to do like who? Lot's wife. Looking back. No, I'm going to go this way. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Here's the second one. Be filled with the Spirit. That means you're constantly being filled one time that you get the Holy Spirit, but there are many fillings of the Holy Spirit. You don't have to come back tomorrow and tarry and wait on the Lord. Once you become a child of God, you are born into the family of God. You've been adopted into the family of God, and he gives you your spirit at that moment. But don't you need to be baptized first? Stop it. Talk to Pastor Kevin about that. Be filled with the Spirit. That's why he said, man shall not live by bread alone, by everything that's written down. You need this. We need this on a daily basis. You should be past five scriptures now. You should be on chapters that you're reading every day. We have material that for you. We have online, everything. And be careful when you go online. Everything is not of God. Here's a third one. Rule our lives by the word of God. Colossians 3, 16. Let the word of God dwell in you richly in all wisdom and teaching. Hebrews uh, 4, 12. For the word of God is living and powerful. It's alive. It's active. It'll meet you right where you are. How many of you read the Bible and God show you up? Amen. I'll raise my hand for all y'all. You, you open it up, and it's like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. That's me right there. And what we do, we don't like to do it, Deke. We go, and we say, ooh. <laughs> Woo. We put it down. I, I do it all the time. I was like, then it goes right back to that same verse. I'm like, okay. Now I have to deal with this. It's there for my edification. He's trying to make me more like Tommy. No, like Reb. No, like my mom. No, like Calvin Knight. No, more like Jesus Christ. Y'all with me? That's why we say Psalms 119, 105. Read that whole verse, that whole, that whole chapter. Your word is a lamp to my what? My feet and a light unto my path. I tell you what you do, don't do it, but try it anyway, just on your life. Go and drive your car tonight without any headlights. <laughs> now, I gave, I, gave a little, I gave a little warning there. Don't do this as an example. Don't go and crash your car, tell your insurance company, Pastor Tommy told me to turn my lights off. Ain't nothing here. Just think about it for a minute. It's like driving a car at night. On Alligator Alley, 
with no lights. You tell me how far you're going to get. His word keeps us straight. It guides us. It's God rails to life. No, you're over here too much, Tommy. No, you're over there. I preach to you as one of you. Here's the fourth one. He tells us to stay humble. Boy, we need that. Stay humble. Micah 6, 8. He has shown you, old man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. Boy, that's what we need a little bit. Of. Take us down a notch. Some of us are stuck on ourselves too much. You say, well, I, I got to be right when I go in front of the mirror. That's fine. You can take however you long you want. But make sure your heart is humble before God. Why? First Corinthians, write it down in your margins. First Corinthians 10, 12, it says, hey, take heed, let you fall. When you're going out thinking that I got this all together, I read four verses of Scripture on Monday, Pastor Tommy preached a decent sermon, I'm out of here, I can leave and go until next week. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. Here's the final one. Pray consistently or constantly be in prayer. When you're driving with your eyes open, pray. When you're cooking a meal, pray. When your children leave the house, definitely pray. When they come home from school, debrief them and pray for them. If they're away in college, pray for them. Pray for one another. The Bible says pray without ceasing. Pray all the time. He says in Thessalonians, in 1 Thessalonians, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, giving thanks for everything. In everything, not for everything. Submit yourselves to God. Then resist the devil and he will flee. But even Michael, the archangel, in dispute with the devil, verse 9, over the body of Moses, did not himself dare condemn him, but he simply said, the Lord rebukes you. Look at verse 10. These people are without understanding. One translation have it, they're ignorant. They're smart, but they're ignorant. One translation called them brute beasts. Verse 10, yet these people slander anything they cannot understand. Listen, if you're not a child of God, that's why Corinthians said, if an unspiritual person can't understand spiritual things. So what they do in Jude, they go out and they just, they're brute beasts on things that they don't know. Why? Because they don't have the spirit of God. They're not Christians. They're not born again. It's okay to ask questions. Well, what was Jude talking about? The assumption of Moses, what is that all about? Yeah, it's good to ask questions. But then look, well, that's not what they do. They just want to just destroy the word of God, doing whatever it feels like doing. Living like animals with animal instincts, the scripture says. They're operating in the flesh. They're getting their sexual gratification off of all of this. Speaking evil of those things they do not know. Why? Because they're not born again. And they're just tricking everyone all over who's not a child of God. See, that's Satan's job is to keep you blinded, to keep you away from the truth, to tell you right now, someone may be sitting here today, oh, that what he's saying, that ain't true. But the question I have for you that I asked earlier, are you ready? One thing that no one here can deny in this room is death. But my question is, are you ready for eternity, either with God or without God? either with God or in hell. Don't pray for people's healing all the time. Pray for their salvation. Don't pray that you'll get a new house. Pray for your children's salvation. Pray for people's salvation. Pray that a person come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. 
that the Spirit will draw them back to himself. They reject authority. They speak evil of dignitaries. Human authority they reject. Angelic and divine. Highly educated, yet they're ignorant. They're blinded. Why? They're not saved. Everyone's all up in arms about who we're going to vote for next week. Souls to the polls that's going on in about a half hour. I'm going home and watch football. At the end of the day, it's not about souls to the polls. It's souls to the cross. Uh, I'm more concerned about are people saved or not? Because at the end of the day, you've been better off playing ping pong. You would have been better off just staying at home. But have you encountered the risen Savior? That you have to give an account for everything. If he lets you in, if he does at the gate, why should I let you in? What will you say? My mama told me about it. Yes, your mama did. My grandmother told me about you. Yes, she did. Pastor Tommy told me about you. Yes, he did. Pastor Kevin, yes, he did. But you ignored me. You wanted nothing to do with me. Now you want to come into glory. Why? What will you say? What will you say? Father, we thank you that you've given us all that we need. And Lord, your scripture tells us, without you, we can do nothing. Without you, Lord, without you, I can do nothing. Lord, I thank you for the Spirit of God that indwells not only me, but everyone who is a believer, who has been washed by the blood of the Lamb, who've come at the foot of Calvary and said, Lord, I'm done running. I'm done fighting this. I surrender my life to you. Come into my heart. Lord, I want to follow you every step of the way. Not because I will escape damnation, Lord, because I love you and what you've done for me. You're the creator. You're the savior. You're the redeemer. You're the soon coming king. Lord, I'm not right in my heart and you know it. Lord, I pray for those in my family who don't know you, who have turned their hearts and minds away from you. If it's your will, Lord, that your spirit would prick them right now, Lord, that they would come to a saving knowledge of who you are. Lord, if there's one person here today who doesn't know you, but yet they are on the pen tip of eternity, It can go either way. Lord, we pray that this day that someone waters or someone plants, someone waters, Lord, but you give the increase. Lord, save those. Lord, we thank you that we can deal with the adversary in your power by submitting to your word and your authority in our everyday life. We can resist the devil once we submit to you. Thank you for the armor of God that you tell me to place on and 